Hello, everybody. Uh, it is I, Jake, member of the Jams and Tea podcast. And today, I am going to be coming at you with a tier list. Now, for those of you who don't know, this is kind of a thing to do where you take one of your favorite bands or a band you're particularly into and you organize their records and releases into particular tiers and those of you who are in the know sort of know that we on the James D podcast have done several worst to best videos on the discographies of people we like uh Tyler did Autecker I have done Chelsea Wolf Porcupine Tree and Tom Waits um Serge has done Biffy Clyro and um those videos are generally very fun uh love doing those but also they take a lot of work uh tier lists uh don't take quite as much work but one of the reasons i like doing them at least in theory is because you get to organize the records by tiers and you don't really have to slave or like debate or get caught up in the particular order of them necessarily you just sort of get to speak your piece on the album and give the listener a good idea of how good that particular record is and where it stands in the sort of canon of the band and i like that approach a lot and considering i have done a worst to best on porcupine tree a long long time ago i and i've been talking about doing uh, redoing it just because my opinions have slightly changed on it uh uh, so I figured this was probably a be good way to do it, and I figured if I enjoyed this or if people liked it, I could do more. So today, of course, we are talking about Porcupine Tree, my favorite band. Uh, we have covered one of their albums on the podcast. We've covered Deadwing. Um, so, you know, if you want my more in-depth thoughts on that, where we have – that's a that's a really dense record. Lots to talk about there. But – you know, it's uh, it's a band that uh, has been with me for a while, progressive rock, progressive metal, psychedelic rock, art rock band uh, fronted by Stephen Wilson. We've talked a lot about Stephen Wilson, some of his solo projects, and Porcupine Tree as a whole. And uh, yeah, this is my favorite band. And currently, this is a more up-to-date uh, sort of uh, summary of how I feel about everything and Porcupine Tree aren't a super hugely popular band so I like doing videos like this to sort of you know give people who may not be familiar or might be interested in something like this gives them a good idea of where to start and what to expect so without further ado let's do this okay we're gonna go in chronological order here we're gonna start with on the Sunday of Life here. Uh, on the Sunday of Life, 1992, Stephen Wilson's uh, album debut for the Porcupine Tree Project. Uh, and he'd already been working and doing work in the musical scene, like production and engineering work, um, had other musical projects, but this is sort of his formal introduction to the world of music. And I won't lie, on the Sunday of Life is not particularly good. It is an incredibly bloated album, and it's an album that is very much in the throes of struggling to find its identity. Stephen Wilson draws from a litany of influences throughout his entire career, but on here it comes off as far less cohesive and far more schizophrenic almost but one of the the two biggest influences i would say are brit pop and um sort of like a shoegaze and kind of art rock influence and it leads the sound to be very disorganized very bloated steven didn't really know what he was trying to do at least in my opinion and on this record and it leads it to be a very very almost disorienting listen and it just does not help this album is so long like this is one of the longer porcupine tree albums and it's not fully even venturing into psychedelic or progressive rock yet so you know eh, it, it's a little shifty i will say you know there are definitely moments on it that hit by virtue of the fact that this is a very scattered project so of course it's going to you know it, it probably hits about as often as it misses 
uh, has as many good songs as bad, but the good songs are never really good enough for me to emphatically recommend them. It's, it's a lukewarm kind of good. And then even the bad things, they aren't bad, bad, but they're bad in a very languid, very uninteresting kind of way. This is without a doubt, in my opinion, Stephen Wilson's weakest project uh, to date. Um, one I do not revisit very often, one that is very not well regarded in particular, and I don't even really think Stephen considers it to be a particularly like like a canon entry in the band's discography, but it does sort of provide a reference for not only where he would go with Porcupine Tree, but some of his solo work, some of his side projects. There is a lot of DNA found in this. Uh, that said, it is hardly an essential listen. Um, I would probably place this in... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and safely place this inside the E tier. Yeah, it's it's not a very good record. Okay, going straight into the sophomore effort, 1993's Up the Downstair. Uh, Up the Downstair is a remarkable step forward from On the Sunday of Life. It is a shorter record, a more consistent record in every single aspect. It's way more honed in on being a psychedelic rock album. There are shades of things like Britpop, of shoegaze, stuff like that, but it's very much in a side kind of influential level. It's, it's not like all of these things sort of competing to be the core of the record. Um, and it, it's a solid album. I, I think that it's a, a very good step forward, sort of putting his feet more formally and showing uh, his interests in the more psychedelic side of the band that sort of uh, pervaded the sound in their earlier years. And while it's definitely a good record and it's very, very uh, enjoyable, I do go back to this on occasion, it's definitely a little bit formless. It's uh, psychedelic rock in a kind of ramshackle way. That's not to say it doesn't sound good. Um, even on the Sunday of Life from a production standpoint is pretty fantastic. Um, this also sounds very good, but it's also a rather esoteric listen. There's a very kind of thin line you have to ride when it comes to psychedelic rock, where you have to sort of leave um, a lot of space for the listener to kind of fill in the gaps and sort of be eased into the world of the music. But also, you know, if you do that a little bit too much, then the music itself can feel kind of vague and occasionally formless. And Up the Downstair does occasionally venture into that territory. It is definitely not one of the better psychedelic rock albums I've ever heard or anything. Um, but I would say that this is an essential listen in the band's discography. I wouldn't necessarily like start here just because it doesn't really give a good impression but it's also something that you need to listen to in order to understand where the following albums were sort of born from and it has some particularly good cuts on it songs like the title track and the final piece burning sky fade away are very very strong pieces um it's it's just sort of it's very much this has the feel of a more proper debut for porcupine tree it's more of a, a focused effort but it's also something that leaves a lot of room to grow um i'd say this is a good album uh in terms of the canon of the band i would place it very comfortably in the c tier okay next up we have third album the sky moves sideways 1995 the sky moves sideways very much considered by most people to be the band's first really great album not just a good album a great album and i have to agree this was my first porcupine tree album and i will say maybe the one weakness that it does have is that it is very indebted to its influences um, that said, this is an album that is almost as eclectic when it comes to uh, sort of the, the genres that it's pulling through uh, as On the Sunday of Life, but it does so in a way that feels way, 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 way more cohesive. It's got that sort of really solid core of being psychedelic rock, but also very progressive rock. Some elements of progressive metal in here too. Like this is an album that does formally introduce the band into a little bit like heavier material. You've got stuff like Dislocated Day, which kind of goes pretty hard. 
um but also there's sort of the more ambient things that like on steven's uh side projects base communion that's sort of bleeding into here there's sort of an uh an ambient rock even kind of post-rock vibe that some of the slower moments on the album have and you know this is definitely a bit of a grower in my opinion um maybe not a great place to start it's kind of got the same structure as pink floyd's wish you were here uh, in a sense, and the remaster and the original versions of the album have two different track lists, which is very strange, and I'm not really sure why they did it. But that said, I do really love this album. I, I think that there's not like a weak uh, moment on here. I think that Stars Die is one of the band's best songs. Um, some of the later versions of the album had the Moon Loop and Moon Loop Coda uh, introduced onto the record, which is sort of uh, from a, an EP that he released at the same time. And uh, yeah, it, it's a great release. Uh, and I, I wouldn't maybe put it up with the tippy top uh, of the band's releases just because they're a little bit more singular, they're a bit more well-formed, but this is a great record, a fantastic step forward. I think that the the building blocks of Up the Downstair are definitely here, but the real sort of charm in this album is seeing just how big of a leap it was and just how confident it was it's the the first album of porcupine tree that feels like a porcupine tree record and as such it is phenomenal i think um maybe give it a little time to spend with you not maybe an immediate listen but a very like occasionally meditative listen too but it's got heavier stuff if you're looking for that as well i would put this very very comfortably in the a tier Okay, 1996, we have the album Signify. Uh, Signify comes a year after The Sky Moves Sideways. And The Sky Moves Sideways, there was a two-year gap between that and Up the Downstair. And you can really feel that Wilson used that time to his advantage, created a longer, uh, more structurally tight record but um, Signify here is definitely considered to be uh, on the same level or at least the same level of quality as Sky Move Sideways, another great album of his that came out afterwards, um, sort of in the, the psychedelic rock era of the band. And I do agree. I think this album is very, very good. Um, the only thing I would really say that I think puts the Sky Move Sideways very, very, very slightly ahead of it is that this album is a little bit more indebted to one particular genre, genre, that being psychedelic rock. There's not as many tinges of metal here. There's a little bit more of the ambient stuff, but this is definitely a record that's on the slower side. It definitely has moments like The Sleep of No Dreaming, which is a really like forward uh, rock song. Um, but it, it's definitely something that feels like maybe it like it feels almost like this was the album that would come out before and then the sky moves sideways is an album that would make sense if it came after this um but i think this is just really wilson focusing more on just a couple of the things that he was interested in and not necessarily the entire scope um but he was so good at incorporating the entire scope on the sky moves sideways that this does feel to me anyway like a little tiny itty bitty bit of a step back that said there's not like a weak point on here this does contain some of the band's most interesting experiments it has songs like light mass prayers it has songs like dark matter uh waiting phase two idiot prayer there's lots of great material on here it's just it's a bit slower it's a bit more of a grower um, I wouldn't say that this is an album that's going to hit you as immediately as anything. Like, if Sky Moves Sideways may have to grow on you, and if that's the case, then this will probably take a little bit more time. But it is definitely a great record. I would say it is almost as good as the Sky Moves Sideways, but it's not one that I return to quite as often just because it's not as exciting, perhaps. But it is still a damn fine record that I will put very, very comfortably in the B tier. Okay, now we have 1999's Stupid Dream. Uh, there's also a little, some of the like lesser projects here in the tier list that I'm not going to go over, like Metanoia. This was made in between Signify and Stupid Dream here. I don't believe that this is actually really a, a studio album thing. I think it's more of a uh, an EP side thing, and thus I won't go into it. Uh, but Stupid Dream here was three years after 
signify. And this is an interesting release just because this is very, very evident of the direction that the band would go. This is the band's most art rock-ish uh, inclined album. Uh, it's very much, primarily speaking, got that sort of propulsive sound, something that would, you know, eventually evolve into something more uh, traditional, like on Lightbulb Sun, the album that followed this. Uh, and as a result, this is an album that is held in very, very high regard, and I have to agree. I think this is a terrific record. Um, save for the fact that I think that maybe it simply doesn't have the really mountainous highs that I think the Sky Moves Sideways did. It is a very consistent record. Uh, I really like songs like Even Less. It's got a really great hook to it. Songs like Piano Lessons, really, really catchy. Uh, songs that are a little less traditional like Slave Called Shiver or Tinto Brass. Um, and The Closer Stop Swimming is fantastic. But it is an hour long and I feel like it could have had a little bit more refinement. This is, a, again, this is sort of a more focused album, kind of like Signify, but as a result, it's it just sort of occupies a very specific niche instead of doing a ton of different things really, really well, which, you know, your mileage can vary. But it's a very, very consistent album. Um, it's maybe the one of the least immediate, even though this is considered to be like a top tier record in the Porcupine Tree canon. I don't quite agree with that. I'd say it's definitely closer to being like, like Signify, where it just sort of carves out its own identity with its specific genres. But beyond that, it feels very much like uh, something in their earlier era, uh, which it pretty much is sort of the pre-2000s era, the 90s era of the band, where Wilson was still really figuring out what he wanted to do. And this is very fully formed, but as a result, I think it does sort of suffer uh, as Signify did from also just being a sidestep because it does retread a lot of sounds that have already been covered. And, you know, that's fine. You know, the, this is already a very eclectic uh, series of albums and a lot of different genres, so it doesn't feel tired, it doesn't feel worn or anything, but it's definitely, again, it's not quite as exciting. You're sort of still waiting for the band to make that really big next leap forward. So I would put this in the B category. I'd say it's as good as maybe Signify. I prefer a little bit more over it, but it's still a very, very, very good record, but maybe not quite as good as the band's really top shelf material. All right, now we have 2000, the Millennium record. We have Light Bulb Sun. Light Bulb Sun. Let me hold on a second here. Those of you who've seen my vinyl video, you know this already, but got this one on vinyl. I also have Sky Move Sideways and a couple other ones on here. Uh, Light Bulb Sun is a really interesting album. It's one of the records that I think maybe isn't cited as often as some of the other uh, records in this band's catalog as being like a quintessential example of a great record, even though typically speaking, I think it's pretty well regarded. Um, it's not considered uh, some of the band's best work. And I can kind of see why. I understand that the mood on here is a little bit more reserved. Again, it's not as initially aggressive or even technically speaking quite as, uh, interesting or idiosyncratic as something like the sky moves sideways but light bulb sun to me is the first really big leap forward the band made since that record here that sort of five years of growing and the occasional growing pains that signify and stupid dream suffer are not found here because it's sort of a synthesis of signify and stupid dream in that it combines uh, art rock and that it combines psychedelic rock and really combines them both to be a more edgier progressive rock sound this is sort of when the band in my opinion sort of arrived fully formed like light bulb sun really does feel like it's uh, emblematic of the entire album uh and it's fantastic this is one of my favorite records uh not only in the band's catalog but of all time really i, I think this is some of uh, Steven's most immediate songwriting. Uh, the title track is fantastic. You have some of the slower ballads like uh, How Is Your Life Today? You have more aggressive cuts like Four Chords That Made a Million. Um, this is kind of a like, uh, I, I 
think Morgan once described it as a breakup album, and I think that's a really good way to describe it. It's got some uh, experiments that are just really, really fascinating, like Last Chance to Evacuate Planet Earth Before It Is Recycled. Um, interesting themes here of isolation and being disconnected from reality that would be sort of elaborated on in the years to come. Uh, and there's also just really awesome moments where Stephen takes his experimentation forward, like Russia on Ice, which is a bit of a grower. It's a very long song, but it's also just a technically fascinating one. A lot of the guitar licks on here are just absolutely delicious. And the end track, Feel So Low, is one of the band's best closers. It's really moody. This is a super... Uh, atmospheric record, but it never really takes a backseat when it comes to energy. It always balances it out well. It has slow songs, but it always counteracts them with a really, really solid structure. This is an immaculately sequenced record. Um, and it's a very accessible one, too. I'd say that this is a great entry point for the band, just because it gives you an idea of all of the sounds that they explore, but in like one of the more palatable ways that it does. And yeah, this is a fantastic record that maybe most people or most Porcupine Tree fans wouldn't hold in the regard that I do, but I think this is the real arrival for the band. And as a result, that combination of accessibility and Wilson's technical proficiency make this one of the easiest ones to come back to for me. This may be the album of theirs I've listened to the most. Uh, and yeah, I, I think it is a virtually flawless album. This to me is a solid S tier record, one of the best. Okay, next we have the big one. Two years later, in 2002, we have In Absentia. And this is by many considered the band's shining moment. This is the Porcupine Tree album in the way that something like uh, Lateralis is the Tool album. And uh, it's also uh, very important because uh, Gavin Harrison, who would later go on to drum on King Crimson's uh, live work, which is some of their best stuff, Gavin Harrison joined the band. And from the first track, from immediately on Blackest Eyes, you can tell the, the drumming is frenetic. It's vicious. This is when the sort of metal influences that occasionally reared their head at points on earlier in the discography really comes to fruition. Uh, In Absentia is like uh, one of the heavier albums in the band's catalog. It's probably the first time you can say that it's genuinely like a solid half of its progressive metal blended with progressive rock. Uh, and I really can't go against the grain here. I think this album is absolutely terrific. I think this album has earned its classic status. I think that it's earned its status within the Porcupine Tree canon. It's just sort of hit after hit after hit. Tons of the band's best songs are on here. Blackest Eyes, as previously mentioned, one of the most aggressive and just absolutely barn burner tracks. It's sort of got that oscillating uh, melody between the choruses and verses that's just absolutely beautiful, but also really brutal. Uh, it's got Trains, which is one of the best ballads ever written, in my opinion. It has fascinating moments of uh, experimentation, like on Lips of Ashes, where Steven gets really uh, these spacious mixes with in, uh, instruments like the harp. And this is a very instrumentally varied record, too. Light Bulb Sun was also. This is sort of when Steven begins to really throw everything in with the kitchen sink. And everything here is just so moody and purposeful and it's immaculately structured I, i'll say that maybe some songs take a little bit more time to grow on you uh specifically uh songs like uh prodigal and the creator has a master tape maybe not songs that'll carry that weight of those first four tracks i think that are on here that are really solid but even then they sort of you know it, it, it's something you have to kind of let grow with you. Uh, I also really recommend this album's uh, B-sides, particularly Drown With Me. Uh, it's a song that I'm a little disappointed didn't make it onto the actual album because it's one of their best. But yeah, this is an album that deals a lot with Steven's fascination with um, serial killers, actually. And you can hear a lot of that in here, sort of serial killers and people who are kind of alienated from society at large and they sort of have a distance and that a lot of this is really like eerie and like aggressive and, and moody. 
and yeah as a result it becomes sort of the definitive record for the band and i can't really disagree this is a great entry point this is my second album that i listened to to get into the band and it was the one that really made me fall in love with it and yeah i think this album is top tier absolutely s tier record okay next we have Deadwing and Deadwing is an album we have covered before on the Jams and Tea podcast. And again, plug that one more time. It's a very good episode where we dig really, really deep into the interesting story behind this record and the story of this record, in that it was sort of a multimedia project. It was kind of meant to soundtrack a movie that Wilson wanted to make, sort of this uh this thing he had already written a screenplay for. It never really came to fruition, but the album itself did we sort of break it down and talk about all of the tracks and everything it's just a very good episode uh go and watch that but uh as if you have seen that episode uh you will know this album is the currently the absolute highest rated album we have covered on the podcast it is the only album right now that has earned a 10 out of 10 from all five of us so naturally you know what i think of the record and that i think this is phenomenal uh after in absentia there's sort of a three-year gap in between these albums and which is pretty evident i think just because this is a titanic record uh it's an hour and nine minutes and um or not an hour and nine minutes i was looking at the wrong runtime good job jake it's actually just an hour long but it fits so much into that hour. We have songs that like Deadwing, songs like Halo, songs like Arriving Somewhere But Not Here. Uh, it's There's just a lot of songs that are really forwardly progressive, Arriving Somewhere But Not Here being in contention for the, one of the best songs ever written, in my opinion, structurally ambitious. And then there are songs like Mellotron Scratch and Open Car, which are kind of sort of left turns that you wouldn't really necessarily expect. This is a very dark record. It's a very atmospheric album. And I think that it's very evident in the sort of gloomy, moodier sound that it's going for. Um, a really good progression from In Absentia, in my opinion. And it's one of the ones I've definitely come back to the most. It's it's a big grower too. It wasn't always one of my favorite entries in the band's discography. Um, it has moments on it, especially in that second half that maybe... Um, will take a while to grow with you in a way that maybe In Absentia uh, doesn't really quite have. But it really does pay dividends, especially when you pay attention to the narrative of play, when you pay attention to how sonically varied this is. This is just one of the reasons that Porcupine Tree is so great is because it makes this aggressive, kind of unfriendly album uh, that still has moments of sort of inviting uh, openness, like uh, Lazarus, that'll sort of just kind of lure you in unexpectedly. And yeah, this is quite expectedly an S-tier record, in my opinion, uh, one of the band's best, uh, one of the band's most ferocious, probably the heaviest band, uh, album the band ever made, and I think it is absolutely divine. I think it's fantastic. Okay, two years later, we have the next album, Fear of a Blank Planet. Fear of a Blank Planet uh, is... In my opinion, you know, I'm not doing specific ordering and I'm not doing like uh, saying which one's better than which uh, super often. But if I had to pick right now what the best Porcupine Tree album is, it is, in my opinion, Fear of a Blank Planet. It's considered by many to rival In Absentia, perhaps be quite as good uh, as it's definitely a little bit more of a dark horse pick than that. But yeah, this, in my opinion, is the most tightly constructed record they've made. It is 51 minutes, six songs long, mainly because it has some longer tracks on here, uh, namely uh, the crown jewel of the band, the incredibly long but incredibly fucking fantastic song, Anesthetize, uh, one of which uh, Alex Lifeson of Rush contributes some guitar work to. And this is just a faultless album, one of the most perfect albums ever made. Uh, every single track, all six of them serve uh, to build towards this greater narrative of the story of this uh, boy with clinical depression and bipolar disorder who has suicidal tendencies, also has sort of tendencies of like wanting to enact a kind of violence sort of school shooter thing, kind of like that post-Columbine uh, 
thing that sort of pervaded music for a while and it definitely grows from the the eeriness of uh the last two records it can be found in here and e even more so sometimes but it's also very mournful it has tracks like my ashes that are just very like captivating and uh, it also has these really triumphant rec uh, songs like my favorite porcupine tree song which is way out of here which is like desperate and and manic and it's just absolutely fucking propulsive uh and honestly it's just a front to back perfect record it it is uh because of the six songs and the the 51 minute runtime it's maybe not the most friendly album it's maybe not the album that you should start with i would work my way up to this one like i did um but as a result it will really really pay off in the end this is one of those albums that i think everyone should hear before they die um it might not be the one that people are just like oh you know i haven't listened to porcupine tree before while it is the best i wouldn't say hey go listen to it uh but this is like the porcupine tree fans porcupine tree album and i can attest to that there are some days where i'd say that this and light bulb sun are my two favorites and I, I'd more commonly say that this one is the best one and my favorite one. But yeah, one of my 10 favorite albums ever. It's a terrific record. All right, and now we have the last record. We have 2009's The Incident, the last album, two years later. This album is uh, interesting just because not a lot of people particularly uh, talk about it. Um, and, you know, it's a later entry in the discography. It's, you know, the last album from a prog band. So, you know, later era prog band albums, kind of like Rush, they, they don't get the attention just because they're not seen with the same reverence. And it's easy to see why. The Incident, um, while I might be a little bit more fond of it than most people, I definitely would say is not a top tier album from the band. It mainly suffers from the fact that it's very, very long but it sort of continues in that more heavy prog metal sound that the last three albums were going in. Uh, it has more conceptual edge to it with the story of a girl escaping a cult. Um, it has lots of great moments, but it has, you know, a lot of moments too that just really slow everything down. You had before this uh, Fear of a Blank Planet, which is this album you know where it's got six tracks and every moment of it feels vital whereas this can occasionally kind of meander it has uh songs like the blind house it has songs like time flies octane uh, uh, octane twisted uh and circle of manias which are all terrific uh songs and that's got songs like your unpleasant family and degree zero of liberty that i remember nothing about and its runtime really kneecaps it. But this does contain many highlights from the band's career. Everything is in top form, but the production is great. The sound of it is great. Vocal performances are great. It is definitely an album I would deem essential just to see the direction the band went in. This is still in keeping with the previous records. It just simply doesn't quite hold up the line of quality the way they do. But it is worth hearing, in my opinion. I would put this in the C tier. And yeah, that is the studio discography of Porcupine Tree. Let me know what your favorite Porcupine Tree albums are, what order you would put them in. Maybe you disagree with me, but uh, I obviously love this band a whole lot. A lot of high ranking albums here. Uh, and let me know if you want uh, other bands that you know I like or, you know, that I want to know my thoughts on. And maybe we can do a couple more of these because uh, I, I really like this. Yeah. Yeah. Porcupine tree. Yeah.